Hi, welcome back. What I want to do in this video, and actually this is going to be the first video in the playlist on the TCA cycle, and what I want to do is I want to really look at some look at a very broad topic and a very very important and often overlooked topic before we actually get into the enzymatic reactions. And this is the concept, this is the concept of high energy charge versus low energy charge. And to understand this, and actually this is extremely important, especially when trying to understand allosteric regulation and, and, and really, especially in equilibrium reactions, which way the enzyme is going to be favored. And it's really important in understanding that. Um, what I want to do is take a practical example to help you understand this. So let's say I just ate a meal, right? I just ate a meal. Let's say I ate some burger meat, you know, a steak, or, you know, had some sweet potato fries, you know, had some almonds for dessert, you know, something like that. So I just ate a meal. And what I want to do is I want to think about molecules that might be in high concentration uh, directly after the meal, so some t short time after the meal. Well, it doesn't really matter which pathway I'm using. Let's say I'm, I'm oxidizing the fat from the steak and I'm oxidizing the sugar from the sweet potato. But either way, um, ultimately what I'm going to be producing is a lot of acetyl-CoA, right? You're going to produce a lot of pyruvate, right? And that pyruvate is going to get consumed by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and you produce a lot of acetyl-CoA, right? Okay. But what else is high during the meal? Well, or after the meal, what else is high? So a lot of these enzymes are going to do dehydrogenations and they're going to produce NADH, right? And we've certainly seen a lot of those enzymes. We've seen glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. We've seen, or, or we're going to see, isocitrate dehydrogenase, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Um, we've, uh, we're going to see malate dehydrogenase. If you watch the beta oxidation playlist, you've seen a beta, beta hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase. All of these enzymes produce NADH. Well, let's think about another molecule that might be high. And this. Um, this is, of course, um, well, well, let's think about this. The NADH is going to go into the respiratory chain. We have a playlist on that. And it's going to be consumed by NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase. It's going to produce ubiquinol. And ultimately, there's going to be a proton pumping, which powers ATP synthase. So one of these molecules that's going to be associated with after a meal is ATP. Fair enough. But then let's think of another situation. Let's think of if I had, haven't eaten in a while. Let's say I've been fasting, right? I've been fasting. Well, let's think about what molecules might be high during a fasting state, right? So um, you, usually what we're going to consider is just the opposite of the other molecules, right? So if I've been fasting, um, I, I'm, use, I'm, not, I'm not actively creating acetyl-CoA, right? Um, or at least in large amounts, I'm not creating a lot of acetyl-CoA, I'm consuming it, right? And so if I consume acetyl-CoA, and that, that's done by citrate synthase, which we'll see in, in, later in this playlist, I'm going to produce a lot of coenzyme A without the acetyl group on it, right? I'm going to produce a lot of this coenzyme A. Likewise, um, there are various enzymes, NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase, which is complex one in the respiratory chain, is no exception. It's going to reoxidize NADH back to NAD, right? So I'm going to regenerate NAD, right? And ATP is going to have two cases, right? It depends on where the hydrolysis occurs. If, if the hydrolysis occurs at the beta phosphate, I'm going to generate what? I'm going to generate. AMP, right? Or if it's if the if the nucleophilic acyl sub, substitution happens at the gamma phosphate, I'll generate ADP, right? So if I'm, you know, I'm gonna, you know, things that require ATP are muscle contraction. You know, you're always contracting muscles, and in fact, you never stop contracting. Your diaphragm, um, which helps you breathe, is is a, is a muscle, and um, it's actively consuming ATP all the time. So you know, so the more you you know you contract muscles, the more you're burning ATP. And so if you haven't eaten in a while, you're not producing as much ATP, and so you're consuming it more, and so you end up producing more adenylate and ADP. Okay, so let's think about this, right? If I am, let, let's think about which one would be high energy charge, which one would be low energy charge. 
Well, I think the biggest giveaway in this one is the ATP, right? If I asked you which molecule was higher in energy, AMP or ATP, you should say ATP, right? And, and so if, if I just eat a meal, I have all the energy in the world, right? Because I'm producing all these molecules and NADH is a reduced cofactor and I've got high energy phosphates in the form of ATP. So after you eat the meal, this is when you're in a high energy charge, okay? And when you are, when you're fasting, you don't have as much energy, right? Um, you haven't eaten a meal, so you have, you have, you don't have as many reduced cofactors. You don't have high energy phosphates. Um, they're, they're lower energy, so this is low energy charge low energy charge, right? So why is this important? Well, it turns out that um, this is important in really understanding allosteric. In other words, in understanding how the reg allosteric regulation of enzymes occurs. So to do this, I want to look at, a, first of all, a generic example. Let me draw an enzyme. So here's my enzyme, and I'll put E for enzyme. And let's say it has two allosteric sites. Two allosteric sites, right? And let's say, for let, let's just say, for instance, in one case, um, ATP binds in the first allosteric site, right? ATP binds in the first allosteric site. And let's say that ATP, in this case, stimulates the enzyme. Let's say ATP, when it binds, it stimulates or increases the activity of the enzyme, right? That's, that, that's the ultimate effect of an allosteric uh, effector, right? Um, in this case, ATP happened to stimulate the enzyme. So what you can expect a lot of times, and this is no exception, that the opposite molecule, in other words, the opposite energy charge, will usually um, inhibit the enzyme, right? So in this case, maybe ADP, maybe ADP lowers the activity of the enzyme, right? So what you'll find in allosteric regulation is a lot of times molecules that uh, stimulate an enzyme allosterically, the opposite charge enzyme will inactivate the enzyme or slow it down. And what I want to do now is I want to look at a real example. I want to look at a real example. And the enzyme I'm going to look at is called isocitrate dehydrogenase. And if you're watching this playlist, we're going to look at the TCA cycle enzymes in more detail in the next few videos. But for now, this enzyme is going to take isocitrate. And isocitrate looks like this. Here's isocitrate. Isocitrate is a tricarboxylic acid. And actually citrate, citrate is actually is also a tricarboxylic acid. And that's where the name TCA comes from. It's a tricarboxylic acid cycle. So here's isocitrate dehydrogenase. And it's going to use NAD, NAD plus. You get out an NADH. And you end up generating something called, and actually you also lose carbon dioxide. And you end up generating something called alpha ketoglutarate. And this is alpha ketoglutarate. So this is this is isocitrate, this is alpha ketoglutarate. Okay. And actually this this reaction is irreversible. Um, a lot of times what you'll find is that um, L, uh, uh, Irreversible reactions are prime targets for, um, for, for enzymes being allosteric. But anyways, this is isocitrate dehydrogenase, and it turns out that this particular enzyme is stimulated. This particular enzyme is stimulated by ADP, and it is inhibited. It is inhibited by ATP. Well, let's think about this, right? Let's think about this. Ultimately, what the TCA cycle does is it takes acetyl-CoA and it metabolizes it. So if I think about this, right, if I, if I, have, a lot of T, if I have a lot of acetyl-CoA, the TCA cycle is going to be running a lot, like it's going to be running really fast. So let's say that, you know, the TCA cycle has been running fast for a while, right, and it's producing a lot of, let me do this in a different color, it's been producing a lot of NADH, another high energy charge molecule, right? It's been producing a lot of high energy charge molecules and, and um, there's also an ATP produced by the TCA cycle by succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. And ultimately the NADH goes into the mitochondria, powers, um, you know, it, it, or it goes into the NADH ubiquin on oxidoreductase, it powers the synthesis of ATP. So now after a while of 
the TCA cycle running really fast and running a lot, I've got a lot of ATP present. Well, if you think about it, if I already have a lot of ATP present, do I really need a lot of NADH? And the answer is no, because um, the NADH's function is ultimately to produce the ATP or to help produce the ATP. So if I've got a lot of ATP, I don't need as much NADH. So ATP, as a result, will tend to slow the slow this cycle down. And it turns out that isocitrate dehydrogenase is the rate limiting step of the TCA cycle. And so if I have a lot of ATP present, I don't need the TCA cycle running as quickly. So ATP will serve to slow down the cycle. And I hope that makes sense to you. Now ADP is going to do the opposite, right? So in, in maybe maybe I've I've wasted all my ATPs, right? They're 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 disappearing quickly. I haven't eaten in a while, right? So the ATP has gone down considerably, and I produce a lot of ADP. So and I also also in the in the making, right? I also would have been I also would have produced a lot of NAD plus, right? So so I produce a lot of ADP. I don't have as many reduced cofactors, right? Um, I, I need more ATP, right? Because if, if I have a lot of ADP, that's, a, that's a, a sign that I have low ATP, right? So if I have low ATP, I need to speed up the cycle so I can produce more reduced cofactors, and then they can go and power ATP synthase. So if, if the cycle is, is, if I need to speed up the cycle, it turns out that ADP does that, and ADP does it by... ADP does it by um, essentially speeding up the cycle. It speeds up isocitrate dehydrogenase. It activates it so that the TCA cycle ultimately uh, uh, gets quicker, right? So let's 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 talk about this one more time just to make sure it makes sense. If I have if I, if I have lots of ATP present, right? So I just ate a meal. I have lots of ATP present. I don't need more ATP, right? Because I already have enough of it. So if I have already enough ATP, I can slow this cycle down. And the reason I can slow it down is because I don't need that NADH. I don't need all these reduced cofactors because their function is to produce the ATP, right? And if I already have the ATP, I don't need the reduced cofactors, so I can slow the cycle down. And ATP slows the cycle down by allosterically inhibiting isocitrate dehydrogenase, right? But let's say I've been fasting and I'm running out of ATP. Well, I need to speed the cycle up, right? Because to, when I speed the cycle up, it's gonna produce more NADH, and that's gonna help produce more ATP in the respiratory chain. So when I'm running out of ATP, the ADP that's present will, will bind allosterically to isocitrate dehydrogenase and speed up the cycle. Does this make sense? I hope it does. And this is essentially what we mean by high energy charge and low energy, energy charge. Things that out in terms of so basically let me do this the the opposite of acetyl CoA is coenzyme A the opposite of NADH is NAD plus and the opposite of ATP is either AMP or ADP and of course that um, is dictated by where the nucleophilic acyl substitution occurs on the ATP but anyways um, the, the, the these are opposites of each other so, so a lot of times what tends to be like let, let's say let's say this is an allosteric activator, right? This is an allosteric activator. A lot of times the allosteric inhibitor will be the opposite. It'll be the opposite molecule. And you can sort of think of these as opposites, right? So let's say, let's say that maybe we have an enzyme that's allosterically activated by NADH. Well, a lot of times, and not always, but a lot of times it will that if it's activated by NADH, it will be inhibited by NAD. And ultimately what this allosteric regulation serves to do is it serves to control ultimately which type of metabolism we're doing, whether it's catabolic or anabolic, right? Um, if we have lots of ATP present, what we tend to do is more anabolic reactions. If we have more ADP present, we tend to do more more catabolic reactions and the catabolism is ultimately serving to produce NADH. So I hope this video helped you understand a little bit on allosteric regulation and what high energy charge versus low energy charge is. In the next video we're actually going to start looking at the reactions of the TCA cycle, uh, the TCA cycle. So see you in the next video.